And if you are already here, we're just going to wait momentarily for more of us to enter the virtual space. Thanks for being with us this evening. We'll get started in just a few moments. All right, we'll go ahead and get started as people continue to join us. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia with Politics and Prose. We're live with author Michael Brenner and Derek Penzlar discussing In Hitler's Munich, Jews, the Revolution, and the Rise of Nazism, which comes out next month. You can find a link in the chat column to pre-order a copy of the book from us at Politics and Prose. We do have a few signed copies, um, so that will be exciting next month when it comes out. If you have a question this evening, please put those in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll move to your questions in the last portion of the discussion, so make sure you get those in early. Um, and if you'd like to enable transcripts for this conversation, go ahead and do so by clicking the CC live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, we do want to thank you out there for joining us this evening. We are very grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and spirits of Float. Let's get on to this great book. Drawing on a wealth of previously unknown documents in Hitler's Munich reveals the untold story of how a once cosmopolitan city became, in the words of Thomas Mann, the city of Hitler. In the aftermath of Germany's defeat in World War I and the failed November Revolution of 1918 through 19, the conservative government of Bavaria identified Jews with left-wing radicalism. Munich became a hotbed of right-wing extremism, with synagogues under attack and Jews physically assaulted in the streets. It was here that Adolf Hitler established the Nazi movement and developed his anti-Semitic ideas. In an electrifying narrative that takes readers from Hitler's return to Munich following the armistice to his cal calamitous beer hall push in 1923, author Michael Brenner demonstrates why the city's transformation is crucial for understanding the Nazi era and the tragedy of the Holocaust. Michael Renner is a Seymour and Lillian Abinson Chair in Israel Studies and Director of the Center for Israel Studies at American University and Professor of Jewish History and Culture at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. His many books include In Search of Israel, The History of an Idea, and A Short History of the Jews. And moderating this evening is Derek Penzler, a William Lee Frost Professor of Jewish History at Harvard University. He takes a comparative and transnational approach to Jewish history, which he studies within the context of modern capitalism, nationalism, and colonialism. Penzler's books include Shylock's Children, Economics and Modern Identity in Modern Europe, Israel and History, The Jewish State and Comparative Perspective, The Origins of the State of Israel, a Documentary History, Jews and the Military, a History, and Theodore Herzl, The Charismatic Leader. He is currently writing a book titled Zionism and Emotional State and is beginning work on a global history of the 1948 Palestine War. On behalf of Politics and Prose, enough from me this evening. Please join me in welcoming Michael Brenner and Derek Penzlar. The screen is yours. Great. Hello, everyone, and hello, Michael. Nice to Hello, see. Derek. Nice to see you. I'm sorry that we're only in two dimensions, but, uh, but thank you for writing this very three-dimensional book. It's a marvelous book, and uh, we have a lot to talk about. So let me, let me begin by asking you something about how you came to the subject, because on one level, it makes sense. I mean, you teach at Ludwig Maximilian when you hesitate in Munich, you're from Bavaria and all that, and yet this book is very different from your previous work. You've worked <clears throat> on the social, political, cultural history of the Jews, primarily in Germany. Um, you've written on German intellectual history, German histor uh, Jewish, sorry, historical writing, uh, Jewish social history, and so on. And this obviously is a book with a much rougher edge. It's a book about a much more painful uh, subject. It deals with more controversial topics. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's any connection between this and your last book. Your last book was a, a beautiful lyrical uh, reflection on the state of Israel. You engage with a variety of controversial topics in that book. Obviously, this is extremely different, but I'm just wondering um, what's left, you, what's led you to leave behind the relatively safe harbors of your previous work and now take on these more, uh, these more uh, painful subjects. <laughs> um, thank you for, first of all, thank you for, uh, 
being part of that. I really appreciate that you um, take your time for this. And your question is really, uh, it's interesting that now that I think, uh, think about it, it, it goes really back a long time. Uh, in fact, it was over 30 years ago that I thought of writing my MA thesis uh, back in, at the University of Heidelberg uh, on the Jewish revolutionaries of the revolution in Munich, 1918-19. Um, in the end, I didn't for reasons I don't have to go into. But so I went back then actually to some archives, looked at some material, and then laid it aside. And then I realized in 2016, 17, so I guess 16, when I started writing the book, um, there is an anniversary coming up, 100 years of the revolution in Munich. And if I never go back to this material, I'll never write that book. So I did go back and I, was really immersed into these issues, but I realized very fast, I cannot just write about the revolution and the Jewish revolutionaries, because there's this whole other part. And that is the rise, the, the turning around, the counter revolution and the rise of right-wing extremism that is the other side of this story. So the book deals with the period between 1918 and 23, which is the, it ends with Hitler's spear hole putsch. So th there are very much two components to the book. There's the revolutionaries themselves. And like you said, there's the counter revolution. And let's, let's turn to the, the revolutionaries because something you say right from the beginning is that the revolutionaries uh, were, many of them were, were Jewish and that it's been, so this has been something that writers in the past have been a bit wary of dealing with, or if they have, and you go back to Goloman uh, and to Friedrich Meinecke, some of the things they wrote, I found quite hair-raising about the Jewishness of these Bavarian revolutionaries. So um, why is it, do you think that it's taken this long for you to come and sort of evaluate this from, from, from a new perspective? And, and maybe you could talk a little bit about really one of your major points in the book, which is that all of these people in one way or another were not just Jewish in a kind of an ethnic sense, but Jewishness meant something to them although maybe very different from the kind of established Jewish community identities you've written about in the past. Yes, okay. Um, so first of all, you're absolutely right. Uh, that topic of the Jewishness of the revolutionaries was avoided basically um, for good reasons. The reason is the people who did not avoid the topic in the 1920s and 30s and even 40s um, were the anti-Semites, especially the Nazis. They loved it. Hitler loved it. Actually, he said in Mein Kampf that uh, he himself became politically active, be active because of this, you know, Jewish communists that he would call them, um, which mostly they were not. Um, so the topic seems to have belonged to the anti-Semites exploiting what they would call, you know, the the judeo the, the judeo communism a very very popular topic among the left and um after the war there were there was hesitation especially in germany people didn't want to touch that topic because it's so sensitive if you talk about them maybe you would you know say something anti-semitic and 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 in germany Obviously, there were basically hardly any Jewish authors left after 1945 who would write it, and German authors just stayed away from the topic for a long time. But what I found interesting, that's what drew me into the MA thesis almost many years ago, um, was the fact that these Jewish, many of the Jewish um, revolutionaries were actually interesting also in terms when it comes to their Jewishness in very different ways. Um, just to give one example, um, Gustav Landauer, one of the main player in all the different stages of the revolution, um, he was very interested in Zionism. I mean, socialist Zionism, but Zionism. He was writing a lot uh, for, uh, for Jewish journals. He was a very close friend of Martin Buber, whom he invited to Munich after the revolution started. Buber came 
to Munich on a visit. And he actually was there when the first prime minister of Bavaria, of this new Bavarian state after the monarchy was toppled, uh, was assassinated. So this is one example, but there were many others. Uh, most of those revolutionaries were intellectuals. They weren't really uh, great politicians, I think, but at this point of time, they filled a gap, they filled a void and, and they became active, but they all had some relation to Judaism. It was not just rejecting it. And that is different from a Trotsky in Russia or from a Rosa Luxemburg in Berlin who did not want to relate their Judaism to their Judaism. Any. Now, none of them, of course, were religious in that sense, but they had some kind of pride when it came to their ethnic heritage, like Erich Mühsam, another revolutionary. He saw himself very much in the tradition of the prophets of the Old Testament. And uh, I think one of the amazing um, sources is when the, Kurt Eisner, the first leader of the Bavarian state after 1918, was um, at, his, at his burial in 1919, um, it was Gustav Lander who gave the eulogy. Uh, so a Jewish prime minister was assassinated. A Jewish uh, fellow revolutionary gave the main speech. And he referred and he said very explicitly, Kurt Eisner, the Jew. And he meant in the tradition of the prophets. And if you look, actually, I can share my screen for a moment, just so you can visualize it. They had this prophetic look. This is Eisner, the first Prime Minister of Bavaria, and this these are some of the other, uh, this is Landauer, <laughs> you see all the long beards, beards, and you see Erich Mühsam here, Ernst Toller, a very important intellectual and writer, uh, and, and then this was the only communist among them at the latest stage of the Soviet republics, you, Eugen Levine was actually born in Russia. So you see some, I think the visual might be interesting here as well, but I'll stop my sharing. So they're all over the map on the left, though. I mean, they range from mainstream social democratic, anarchist, communist. I mean, they're, they're all over the place. Um, and without resorting to any of the anti-Semitic tropes, how would you, from a sort of historical sociological perspective, explain the fact that uh, you know, in Bavaria at this time of crisis, um, there were so many Jewish revolutionary leaders. This is not unique to Germany, that there was that moment after World War I where Jews were prominently visible among the leadership of the communist movements and the social democratic movements in much of Europe. So I guess the first question would be, why do you think that's the case? And the second question is, how do we, or how do you then in your book deal with the political affiliations of the great masses, let's say, of German Jewry, which were very different from the political sentiments of the uh, Jewish revolutionaries. Yeah, that's an important point. Um, well, I think that the situation and the reasons for why at this moment you have the emergence of uh, Jewish leaders in politics are the same as in Russia or in Hungary, where you have a Bela Kuhn and others, or in Berlin, it was less. It was just Rosa Luxemburg, really. Uh, mainly. Um, but the reasons were about the same. First of all, Jews were banned from these leading positions in Germany until 1918. Yes, they could be members of parliament, but although they were equal citizens, it was an unwritten law that a Jew would not become any uh, minister in a government, not to speak even of prime minister. So that was not possible in Germany before 1918. At the same time, they were a small but very educated uh, middle class and, uh, and politically active very often. And um, of course, they also represented, and, and I speak about not the Jewish population as a whole, but these, these small groups of Jewish revolutionaries reacted to, a, to, to some way of feeling excluded in the more conservative or reactionary regimes like in Russia, uh, but also like in Imperial Germany. 
And, um, and many of the workers uh, movement, I mean, uh, many members of the, of the socialists um, were less educated, they were workers, they came from the proletariat. So you had a, 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 a small Jewish elite in there, uh, but you never see them as concentrators in Munich. And honestly, I think uh, these are just this more or less some coincidence that happened in Munich. Um, but, but observers at the time noted that. And in the first moment, Jews were proud of it. And they write in the paper, oh, now we have a Jewish prime minister. Wow, he's basically the first and the last ever in any German state. I mean, prime minister back in the German state meant more or less a governor today. And you know, would say in America, it's hard to compare. And it was never another one really. And then, um, uh, somebody like Gustav Landa or one of the revolutionaries wrote to Buber and said, oh, you have to write the story of the Jews in the revolution. They were kind of proud of it. But very soon uh, we see what you said before. The Jewish population was not so happy about it. Uh, accordingly, like in, like in Russia, when the saying uh, we know of the saying, you know, the Trotskys make the revolutions and the Bronsteins pay the price for it. The Bronstein, of course, was Trotsky's real name. So the Trotskys make the revolution, but the Jews have to pay the price for it. And the Jews of Munich knew that very well. And I would even go as far as to say, besides the anti-Semites, nobody hated the Jewish revolutionaries so much as the majority of Munich's Jews, who, by the way, were mostly conservative, many even monarchists, and, um, and they knew if that doesn't go well, we'll pay the price for it. And that's what they did. You, you said that these um, you know, Jewish revolutionaries, for the most part, they weren't the greatest politicians in the world. They weren't terribly effective, but there's, there is one big exception, uh, which is Eisner, Kurt Eisner. After all, he'd been a very successful social democratic journalist and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about his his gifts. Um, you can see, just you showed his image. There's a there's a charisma to him, and I'm wondering how he was able to make that transition from being a journalist to a revolutionary. But even more so in this chaos, you know, in late 1918, how he was actually able to win the support to overthrow the Bavarian monarchy. That's not something that one can do, you know, on the turn of a dime. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, um, you have to imagine the situation in November of 1918. People were really fed up with the old regime. People were fed up with the, with the monarchy. And they were looking for something new. And they were looking for something new. They didn't necessarily knew what that would be. And when Eisner came and uh, declared on November 7, by the way, two days before the Kaiser, the, the, the emperor, was toppled in Berlin. Uh, two days before that, it happened in Munich um, with the 700 year long ruling dynasty of the Wittelsbach. Uh, the, the king uh, fled the city. Uh, and as they said, people went to bed with the king and woke up with the, uh, with the Republic, with Kurt Eisner. Uh, it was a totally peaceful transitioning. Um, there was no resistance from uh, the soldiers, from the police, from all the old elites. It was very easy. They all, there was no, not a single victim in that transition from the monarchy to the Republic in Munich. And, and it's, it's interesting. I mean, uh, I can uh, maybe just, um, uh, just, just uh, read uh, one account uh, what happened in the palace, the palace administrator, uh, noted later, when the most sovereign gentleman had left the residence, I shut the windows in the royal palace, helped distinguish the lights, and after the officiant on duty and the footmen, who had no further instructions, had left, I closed all the doors and made my way to the chapel courtyard. And the next day, Eisner moved in. So <laughs> that was the revolution in Munich, a very German revolution, if you want. Um, and at the same time, uh, as you say, Eisner was so central to that. Um, he had become a leader. So first of all, he was not a radical. 
<clears throat> he was actually before the war a part of the more moderate wing of the social democrats. He definitely was no communist. And during the war, he moved to the left in one very important way that he opposed the continuation of the war. He wanted the war to stop and he was one of the leaders that split from the Social Democratic Party and founded a party called the, the Independent Social Democrats who wanted to stop the war. And he also organized some strikes of ammunition workers in early 1918. So he, he was somehow a figure in Munich that was seen as a resistance to this old regime. But nobody, I think, even in, in, in October of 1918, would have thought he would become the, the, new, uh, the new prime minister, the new king, so to say. And in fact, um, it, it was the uh, historian or journalist, Sebastian Hafner, a great, great writer, who said it was a one-man show under the direction of Kurt Eisner and with Kurt Eisner in all the leading roles. And then he went on to list all the different uh, players in Berlin. And he said, Eisner was at the same time the Otto Wels and the Liebknecht, the Emil Barth and the Scheidemann in a certain sense, even the Ebert, the first president of Germany of the Munich revolution in as much as he was the only one to know exactly what he wanted and how to bring it about. So he was a very central player in this revolution. So these are historical issues that go way beyond his Jewishness or anti-Semitism. It gets to issues about his political genius and great person theories of history. And we can ask ourselves if there really would have been a revolution if there hadn't been an Eisner to, to lead it. But, um, but of course the two contexts of your book are his and, and your other protagonists' Jewishness and then the reaction to it. So let's let's turn to the, the anti-Semitism that is always there in the book and becomes especially prominent as the book goes along. So after 19, 1918, there is steadily growing anti-Semitic rhetoric and anti-Semitic violence. And the question that you and lots of people who work on German history have thought about is to what extent this is something that is is it simply more of the same because there had been political anti-Semitism in Germany going well back into the 19th century, or is it something qualitatively different? The, 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 the street scenes you describe, the political discourse you describe, is this something that somebody you know, in 1912 simply could not have recognized as being of a piece? Yeah, I, 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 I believe that is correct. I don't think anybody in Munich uh, could have envisioned in 1912 what happened in 1919 or 20 or 23. Um, of course, the roots of a modern kind of anti-Semitism, in fact, the word anti-Semitism was created in 1879, not that long before, and this signaled something new. It wasn't the old anti-Jewish hatred based in, a, in many ways on religious uh, motifs and, and beliefs. It became a, a racially uh, dominated anti-Semitism, which you could not escape anymore by converting. So if you were born to Jewish parents, even if they had converted, uh, anti-Semites would now regard you as a Jew and therefore uh, as an object to hate. So there, the, these roots were there, the seeds were there before the war. What changed after the war and what, what I think this became a deadly combination was the humiliation, the defeat of Germany, and then the humiliation uh, at the Versailles Peace Conference that they lost territories, that they were declared the only and single cause that uh, the country that caused the war. Um, and, 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 and both the payments, the actual payments and the symbolic humiliation um, and the idea uh, spread of course by the conservative Prussian generals of World War I that Germany could never have lost the war on the battlefield. So they created what became known as the stab in the back legend. It was the enemies in the, in, in, within Germany the socialists and the Jews, oh, and if you were both, of course, it was worse, um, who uh, brought Germany down. And this combination of this new, of this new anti-Semitism that started before World War I and 
the search for a uh, scapegoat for this humiliation of Germany after World War I, that's what came together. I also would say people would not have thought it would happen in Munich. Before the war, it was Berlin. It was militaristic Prussia that was often seen as the hotbed of the right wing. And in contrast, Munich was the center of the liberal arts and the Bohemian. It was really the center of, of, of liberal thought in many ways. It turned around after World War I. And Thomas Mann says this very eloquently uh, in, uh, in an essay he wrote in 1926, uh, where he uh, says uh, Munich actually became, as he described it, a stupid city. Um, and, and a city were, which was once the democratic city and now became a feudal militaristic. Um, yeah, just, just one sentence. Here one enjoyed a live, live, lively humanity while the harsh air of the world city in the north, Berlin, could not do without a certain misanthropy. And he goes on and, and contrasts how liberal Munich was before the war and how it changed. Or a native of Munich, famous writer, best-selling author, uh, Jewish-German author, Leon Feuchtwanger, wrote uh, also in, in, in the late 20s, in former times, he says, the beautiful, comfortable, well-beloved city had attracted the best brains in the empire. How was it that all these had left now and that all the lazy and the vicious who could not find a home in the empire or anywhere else rushed as if magically drawn to Munich? And honestly, I don't have the answer to that. I think there were many factors that why Munich became the top. And it was just, I think, like a magnet. Once you had a few of those reactionary, very right-wing forces, later, of course, including Hitler in Munich, they drew others. And, and Munich became that hotbed of anti-Semitism. So you're describing then, I mean, there's geographic variations. You're saying Munich was particularly, there was a particularly intense anti-Semitism, but it's all over Germany during the 20s and, and early 30s. Um, you know, the notion of the Judeo-Bolshevism and the stab in the back legend. Um, and there, there are aspects of German anti-Semitism at this time that strike me as um, it's not just a question of volume. It's also there are ideological distinctions between it and anti-Semitism, however vile it was in other countries. One thing that German anti-Semitism never developed is a notion of like the difference between our Jews and foreign Jews that um, you, know, you mentioned in your book where Jews who are of Austrian origin or Eastern European origin get chucked out, right? They get expelled. Um, from, from, is it from, from Bavaria? Um, yes. And yet, you know, historically, there's certainly in the 1930s and during World War II, in a lot of East Central European countries, or in France itself, there's anti-Semitism, but a notion that the Jews who've been living in the country for a long time, they might be lower, I mean, they might be considered uh, suspect, but they're, they're ours somehow, whether it's in historic parts of Romania, or of Hungary or of France. And there's this phrase that's often attributed to the right wing in World War II, get your dirty hands off our dirty Jews. That is, we have the right to, disp to, to, to figure out what to do with Jews. Whereas in territories that say, Romania acquires after World War I or in, or in the case of France, you have Jewish refugees who come into France, um, that they, they're foreign and therefore they're the one, they're the first ones to be arrested sent to their deaths. And that that aspect in German anti-Semitism seems to be much less present. It's basically a Jew is a Jew is a Jew, even if you're a German Jew and you've been there for maybe not quite as long as the Wittelsbachs. But, and that, that just is an interesting phenomenon. And I was wondering um, if we have any idea why that's the case or if it's just inexplicable. Hmm. Well, well, I would first say it. you have also some of that, especially in Bavaria in the early 20s where the East European Jews were the victims long before, or were seen as the target long before the German Jews. And when I see, say East European Jews, I mean, technically these were people who did not have 
German citizenship. They could have been born in Germany already, because when you were born in Germany, you didn't automatically get German citizenship. So some of them already were born or grew up in Germany, and um, and 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 they became the first victims. Uh, and and there were two phases: one in 1920 already, and one in 1923 where the Bavarian government tried to expel, not all of them, but all of them who had like some record with the police who, or, 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 or who had become wealthy. That was suspicious. That was something um, people would, would, would think, oh, you're war profiteer. You profited from the war. Everybody lost their money, but you made money. That was the reason, all kinds of reasons. And it was, so there was a division. And, and they also didn't, the problem is that they'd hardly have anywhere to go. Um, the police at the time in Munich was a hotbed of the early Nazi uh, party members. I mean, they would later, be, they, the Nazi party didn't even exist yet, but these would become uh, the police president of Munich and the chief of the political police in Munich were great supporters of the early Hitler. Uh, so you couldn't really go to the police because they knew they were anti-Semitic. Uh, the church was problematic too. It was very influential, the Catholic church in Munich. Uh, the cardinal, I mean, it was archbishop, later became Cardinal Fallhaber, uh, as we now know from his diaries, which were just discovered a few years ago. He was not a great lover of the Jews, more of the traditional anti-Judaism. So they couldn't go to the church. I mean, they still did, but they didn't help. Uh, and then the government was not, uh, the government tried to expel them. Uh, actually, the only ones that tried to help the East European Jews um, were the consuls, the foreign diplomats, because not because they loved the Jews so much, but the Austrian and the Polish consulate, they didn't want them to be expelled into their territory. So at some point they said, if you expel the Jews into Austria or Poland, we'll expel Bavarian citizens. So that helped and that kind of put it to an end. Um, but as you say, there was then a different stage. Um, and I, this one document that came about uh, was about one of the leaders of the Jewish community in Munich going to the police uh, in 1923 and saying, but you can't, you can't expel East European Jews today. Uh, you know, this is, this is something in the Middle Ages, uh, but not in 1923. And, and the police president said, you know, we cannot only expel East European Jews, we can expel you too. And that's where we see what you say. So that, that starts to be seen. Um, and, and that I think is where, uh, you know, it's, it's part of this new uh, anti-Semitism embodied by Hitler and the Nazi movement, which does not distinguish if you're East European or German Jew, if you're Jew or a Catholic, as long as you have, as they would see, Jewish blood. No, it's this, and, and the notion of an existential threat, um, a universal existential threat, which could be internalized, as you write about in some of your book's most disturbing points by Jews. There's the, the phenomenal character of Paul Nicholas Kosman, who actually helped propagate anti-Semitic lies. Can you talk a little bit about him? So, yes. So one of the, uh, he's my favorite, I mean, my favorite villain or negative character in the book, because he was not a nice guy, I think. Um, but, um, but he's a fascinating guy. Uh, but before I talk about him, let me just, because you, you're alluding to now the, the, the right wing Jews in there. And I think we have to realize that, of course, Jews are not by nature left wing. I mean, uh, we tend to forget we have Jewish fascists in, under Mussolini until the movement became anti-Semitic because the Nazis pushed, Hitler pushed him to be anti-Semitic. Uh, there were uh, Jewish fascists and, you know, we have that today. <laughs> look at France, but uh, look at here too. Uh, the right Jew, we have, of course, right-wing Jews and it's a, it's, a, it's a wrong idea we don't have them. Kosman was a specific character. He had actually converted, so he didn't see himself longer as a, anymore as a Jew. Um, he was probably the least known, most influential figure in Munich after World War I. He was the person behind 
the really uh, behind the most important daily newspaper, you know, like the Washington Post, the New York Times of Munich, the Münchner Neueste Nachrichten, which he helped to to ch switch to 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 change from a liberal paper to a conservative paper. Um, he was an important intellectual, very smart guy, very well connected with all the conservative figures of this new Munich establishment. Of course, not a Nazi. I mean, he was not, he couldn't have been. Um, <clears throat> and he was one of the people who propagated and, and promulgated the stab in the back legend that it was leftist Jews who helped Germany uh, uh, lose the war. He edited another journal and he had a terrible uh, caricature a picture on the title page of this guy stabbing the back. And you could, you know, and Jews were very upset and very. Uh, but, but in the end, of course, he, under, after 1933, uh, he had no role anymore in Munich because for the Nazis, he was just a Jew. And he was, he ended, uh, his life ended in Theresienstadt, in the camp in, in Theresien, the concentration camp. And in the end, he died as a Jew. Right, right. It seems, I mean, that's the question of one individual, but there does seem to be an aggregate or a collective Jewish political behavior you talk about that Orthodox Jews in Bavaria could uh, form an alliance with what was called the Bavarian Volkspartei, which is a conservative political party. And there is a tendency in the contemporary, in contemporary America or going back a few decades, you know, Orthodox Jews finding their political interests align with conservative parties. Can you talk a lot, a little bit about what, what was going on in the Munich context in the early sure. 20s? Yeah, and the Munich context, I think, was very different from what is we see in America under Trump. Um, in, in Munich after World War I, the, the Orthodox had one main reason. I mean, maybe there were other reasons, but one main reason to be allied to the, actually not the most conservative parts, but the Catholic center party. Now, that might sound a little weird first, Lands, but they openly, rabbis, the Orthodox rabbis, um, um, supported the Catholic party because they had one thing they both wanted, and that was the continuation of denominational schools. They were very much in favor of Jews going to Jewish schools and you know Catholics in Catholic schools and so on. And if you know if, if if the city if the town was too small to have a Jewish school, they at least have a very clearly defined Jewish education. And that's what the Catholics wanted too. But the new state, even after the socialists uh, were you know no longer in power, 1919, uh, the new republic uh, was all for you know inter. Uh, denominational schools and not 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 according to to religion. So, um, so that was the main motif. But also, just by nature, Orthodox Judaism usually um, is not in favor of you know the more left wing socialist movements, which are not so much supporting religion in general. So that was their main motif. I think it's different. What we today it's so hard to compare. But today, I mean, it's so much about Israel, actually. And, and that is a little, uh, of course, that wasn't an issue in 1919. No, it's different. And yet, even as you're speaking now, the parallels are obvious. Um, and there's, I mean, there's the, the issue of Orthodox Jews making political alliances for strategic reasons. There's also the fact that there are Jews, like you said, they're not existentially left-wing. There were Jews who fought in the shock troops to, um, uh, prevent or to overthrow the leftist Jewish Fry Corps. But uh, maybe I can push you a little bit as we move towards the end of this part of the, of the event to talk a little bit more about those political parallels. I know that you're a responsible historian. You don't want to simply say that it's exactly the same. And yet, you know, when I looked at your, your, your discussion of the trial of Kurt Eisner's assassin and the way that he was lionized and the way that the court and so much of Bavarian public opinion supported him, it just reminded me of the viewpoints of the January 6th insurrection where people have you know admitted that something went wrong or something happened but it wasn't nearly as bad as what you know the democratic party is saying and basically defending people who have committed who have committed serious crimes but yeah a, absolutely you know there, that that we we do seem to see be in a moment of political crisis that at least in some ways is similar to what you describe in your book 
Yeah, no, I, I, I think, uh, as you say, I'm, as a historian, we're all very careful and, and always point to the differences and we should not forget their huge differences. But when I wrote the book in German, I never thought it would be somehow relevant for the American, in the American context. I, you know, after January 6th, uh, I, 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 and I said that in op-ed in the Washington Post back then, that is interesting because with all the differences, we also see um, one, you know, first of all, after the failed, I, I end the book with a failed Hitler's, Hitler beer hall putsch. And many people thought Hitler is done, he's over, he's gone. But of course he was back, it took him 10 years and he was chancellor of Germany and Führer, you know. And, and, and I think, you know, we have to be very careful as we know now, things are not over here either. But the other thing, as you say, is to acknowledge, the, the refusal to acknowledge that uh, the right or right wing politicians want to overthrow the regime, want to overthrow the democratic structure of the state. And the conservatives or many conservatives being so convinced that they can contain the extreme right wing. So that's what we see in the Weimar Republic, even in 1933, when Hitler is appointed chancellor, we have a von Papen who says, oh, we can contain Hitler. We, we the conservatives, uh, he, you know, we will control him. And now we see here too, we see many people who know better in the Republican party, but who would say, you know, he will help us to come back to power, but it's not us, it's not us. And they cannot contain uh, anti-democratic forces, which I think is, is it's, it's, I mean, it's sad. It's how the perils can play out. Um, and, 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 and that's a parallel I see. I, I also think that uh, uh, we re the, the, the real threat to democracy are not the theoretical that we have, but the real threat are the, the bystanders, those who know how but who allow this to happen. No, the parallels are numerous and that the right, the extreme right swallows the so-called moderate right. And the same thing can happen on the left, of course. The Bolsheviks destroy the Mensheviks. Right, right. And people like, you know, Gustav Kahr is killed by the Nazis in 1934. Um, just one final point question before we move on, open things up to the questions. We've gotten some very good questions. Um, again, about, about anti-Semitism in post-World War I, Bavaria and Munich. It's also about Jews, uh, the Jewish masses, also this remarkable collection of Jewish revolutionaries. And it seems like they embody the fundamental political problem Jews had in interwar Europe as a whole, which is they had a lot, they had to make political choices. Are they gonna be socialists or anarchists or communists? For some, it's gonna be a decision to line up their fortunes with conservatism, um, maybe with Zionism. The Jews had political choices that for the most part were, were, were tough choices, maybe sometimes bad choices, um, but the stakes were very high. There's a new book by our, our colleague and friend, Ken Moss about Jews in Poland in the 1930s and how they faced, you know, any political choice they made was going to be fraught. And it just seems like your book, there's a great deal of humanity that you display towards your, your Jewish revolutionary characters, that, that they were all making political choices as best they could given their own ideology, given the atmosphere they lived in, given what they thought Germany could become. And that's just thing I wanna stress that although the book is obviously very disturbing for its depiction of anti-Semitism, there's also a deep humanity in, in your depiction of the Jewish revolutionaries. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that as a comment. Uh, but sure, I think they were pretty bad politicians mostly, but 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 good people. You know, uh, they should probably not have entered politics. And some of them ended terribly. Most of them ended terribly. I mean, Eisner was assassinated uh, three months after he entered his office. Uh, Landara was uh, terror. I mean, brutally murdered uh, once the revolution was over. Uh, Levine was executed. Um, others were killed later in concentration camps. Or Ernst Toller took uh, committed suicide. 
in 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 American exile after thirty three, and um, so so uh, the end, and I, I I speak in the epilogue, and even Cosma on the right wing. And in one last maybe remark, because you mentioned the assassination of Eisner. I mean, there were so many kind of weird characters in this short period in Munich. And I, we only scratched the surface in this talk, but even the assassin of Eisner was a young Count von Arco, um, partly Bavarian Austrian aristocracy on his father's side, but his mother was a Ney Oppenheim. And uh, although she was already converted, uh, had converted to Christianity, her parents converted to Christianity, she came from a Jewish family. So when young Count Artico wanted to enter one of those right-wing associations, he was not allowed because he didn't have an Aryan, purely Aryan ancestry. So he tried to prove himself and kill the Jewish socialist prime minister. And then he became the hero of the right-wing, although not totally because some knew about his ancestry and they were a little skeptical about it and then he becomes that weird character and nobody knows what to do with him after 1933 when hitler is in power reminds me of the jew who wrote the uh, propagandistic song in world war one or poem the Haskazan gegen england the, the hate song against england and anti-semites would say well only a jew could have written something so hateful <laughs> And he was trying to just assert his patriotism. But let's turn to, um, we've got some really good questions and we have 15 minutes. So let's, um, the first question is um, about your comment about how different Jews engage with and express their Judaism during this time. Um, can you talk a little bit about this similarity, let's say in our own era or across the 20th and 21st centuries, the same kind of diversity. And I think the really interesting thing would be to talk about, you mentioned the non-Jewish Jew, uh, the Rosa Luxemburg, Trotsky type of figure, but then these more amorphous forms of Jewish identity that you as ascribe to the revolutionaries, to what extent has this remained an important source of, of Jewish identification, even in our own time? Right. So let me just give one example. Uh, oh, but it's, uh, it's of the time back then, um, but I, I think some of it remained. Um, at the height of the revolution, so there were different phases of the revolution. We didn't go into the, the book has a timetable, which I think is very useful at the end. Uh, and you can, because it's complicated. So there was a, you know, democratic kind of social democratic phase under Eisner. And then there were two uh, Soviet or council republics in early 1919. And, um, at some point, the leader of the Orthodox Jewish community in Munich, Sigmund Frankl, a very um, highly regarded person of the middle class, middle class Munich, uh, has this letter. And he goes with this letter to the newspaper and wants it published where he distances himself in the name of the Munich Jews from these terrible revolutionaries. The problem is that second revolution happens that same day. So the paper is taken over by the revolutionaries. They, of course, don't publish the letter. It's published in the, a year later. And the interesting, one of the more interesting things I found is one of the revolutionaries, Erich Musam, who by then is in prison because of his participation in the revolution, answers from prison. And he doesn't say, you know, I don't care about, you know, who, if you call me Jewish. Or, he cares. And he says, you, you capitalist Jew, you don't represent the Jewish values. I may not be religious. I may never go to synagogue, but I am in the tradition of the prophets of the Old Testament. And I found this really interesting. And I think that has something of, you know, uh, definitely something's left in today among left-wing Jews and the, you know, of course, it's, it's very often today, it's all about tikkun olam. That expression was not yet, I think, very popular in 1920, but that's what it was. Exactly. There's a couple of questions that deal quite specifically with the book, uh, with the book's major theme. Uh, Ronald Raphael asks about the inflation, the mm -hmm. hyperinflation of 1923 and what role that plays on the the destabilization of society all over Germany, but particularly in, in Munich and, and, and in Bavaria. Right, uh, I mean, sure, it was one and, and, and an important factor in the destabilization um, that 
led to the search of these strong men. And in fact, I would even go further and say the end of inflation in 1923, uh, they overcame the inflation, be, starts this period of political stabilization. Uh, most historians would date it between 1924 and 1929 until the next economic crisis comes even worse. But these five years were pretty stable years. And of course, these were also the better years for the Jews of Munich, um, where anti-Semitic incidents um, are not as, I mean, you still have more than in other cities because Hitler is there, his movement is there, but, um, but it, it, they feel better. And um, that's the old rule. If, uh, you know, under a stable regime, it's always better for minorities, including Jews, than under uh, economic or political uh, chaos. There's also a question from Siddhartha Banerjee. And by the way, we've never met, but I've read your work and admire it very much and cited it in a couple of publications. But anyway, that's an aside. Could you comment on Rathenau, Walter Rathenau, who is a truly tragic figure yeah. and fits into your, he fits into your story in so <clears> many, <throat> although he's hardly a, well, in his own way, he may have thought of himself a revolutionary. So anyway. <laughs> yeah, good point. So Walter Rathenau, for those who are not familiar, was uh, probably the most, the best known uh, German Jewish politician in that period. Um, he became prime, uh, sorry, he became foreign minister uh, in 1922. And uh, only a couple months, few months later, he was also assassinated. He was not a socialist. He was a kind of mainstream centrist, probably the most intellectual among German politicians at the time. Um, and there are parallels. First of all, there are parallels in the way that um, the Jews, the Jewish population would, would see him. And he had, he tried to, you know, kind of distance himself from all kinds of organized Jewishness without converting, but that would be the last step which he didn't take. Um, when Eisner became prime minister in 1918, so one of the most important impressive collections, archival collections uh, for me was his, um, his papers in Berlin. And they were quite, I mean, tons of anti-Semitic uh, letters against him. But there were also Jews who wrote to him, oh, you cannot do that. You cannot become prime minister. It will just be, you know, we will pay the price. When Rathenau was to become foreign minister, it was Albert Einstein, and Kurt Blumenfeld, the leader of the Zionist movement in Germany at the time, who went to Rathenau's house and spent almost the whole night with him to talk him out to become prime minister, eh, become foreign minister, because they thought as a Jew, he, Germany's not right for that. And he, of course, like Eisner before, and said, you know, I have other concerns than that. I am a German, I am a German politician, and I, it's not important to me that my parents were Jewish. So there is a parallel. And in the end, there is a parallel. Both were assassinated after a few months, not the least because they were Jewish. And the important thing is that after Rathenau, you have no other Jewish politician, Weimar Germany, who really became well-known. He was the last one, actually, until today in Germany, you can say, the last Jewish politician who was really in any important position. Uh, and I think that that says a lot. It's, yeah, it does say a lot. There's a, uh, you mentioned how much you gained from going through Eisner's own, own papers. And there's a question about other sources from the time period that were particularly valuable for you or writers, for, for example, and you mentioned Thomas Mann, but were there yeah, um, works of fiction, uh, works that gave you a sense of the general spirit of the time, but also the primary sources that you worked with? What was particularly yeah. important for you? Yeah, no, good question. So first of all, yes, fiction was one of the great, I mean, there is so, because many of those actually act, I mean, the people active in this time were intellectual, were writers. Uh, and they write about it. So yes, Oscar Maria Gaff, who was a non-Jewish um, kind of anarchist socialist, uh, depending on which time, writer who later had to emigrate, lived in New York. 
he wrote a great work on that, but also Toller and then Leon Feuchtwanger. I mean, if you want to read about the rise of the Hitler, of the Nazi movement and Hitler, um, read Leon Feuchtwanger's success. He wrote this before Hitler became chancellor in 1930. I think it's an, and all of the figures are there with different names. Hitler is called Kutzner, and, and it's it's amazing that he wrote this already in 1930, and and other works. So yes, literature. The other sources. There's a rich archival, uh, uh, there, there's so much archival material about it. Uh, of course, the Munich archives, uh, and not just the city archive and the state archive, but also the, the church archives. And then, um, uh, you, you know, Berlin, as I said, the, 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 the estate of Eisner and others. But he, right here in Washington, I was very lucky to be here because there's so much material. First of all, the Library of Congress has more newspapers from Munich at the time than you can find in Munich. Uh, and, and I guess many of them were destroyed in the war, but not here. And then the uh, National Archives. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what was one of the most fascinating collections for me were, was the collection of the Consul General in Munich, the US Consul General in Munich, uh, because once the situation got kind of known what's happening to these East European Jews and anti-Semitism in Munich, not Berlin, in Munich. Uh, there were some Jews of German descent, um, you know, the famous families, the Schiffs and the uh, Barbergs and, uh, and, and many others, who had a private connection to the State Department or to the Secretary of State, in fact, and their letters. So they wrote to the Secretary of State. Secretary of State writes to the ambassador in Berlin, the ambassador writes to the consul general. And what is interesting in this correspondence is you can see, well, they're concerned and they're concerned because some uh, of their, you know, maybe wealthy, wealthy donors are concerned, but there's a lot of anti-Semitism in the State Department. And then you, in the internal correspondence, you see like, oh, but yes, but they are the revolution and they are the war profiteers. And you see some of that reflected in the state, US State Department. There's time for, um, oops, I was, somebody had a question. I was actually typing an answer to them um, about whether the, the book Success by Feuchtwanger, if it's been translated into English. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's translated, yeah. Great, so we have time for one more question. We have three minutes. It's an interesting question. With it's a, a contemporary one, but I think it has a historical root, which is that the big debate, or one of the many big debates about anti-Semitism now, is whether the Jews are sui generis and anti-Semitism is unique, or whether it's part of a broader issue about hatred um, for marginalized groups. In Germany of the early 1920s, I mean, anti-Semitism. I think has a very different valence, although one could argue that Jews are not the only collective group that is marginalized or, well, not marginalized, but discriminated against. I mean, I'm thinking about Poles in the, in the Ruhr Valley who were the object of, of um, a lot of prejudice. Um, but is, is this a case where we simply can't make historical parallels where German society was just so different in the early mm -hmm. 1920s that um, the way that Jews perceived anti-Semitism was simply quite different from the way American Jews would perceive it today. Yeah, well, I, I do agree with the statement that usually anti-Semitism is part of a larger attack against other minorities or against other groups. Uh, the fact is that there weren't uh, too many comparable minorities in Germany in the 1920s. I think had there been a Muslim community, they probably would have been targeted too. So they targeted others like political, like the right targeted the left. Uh, and, and, and as you say, some of the polls um, in, 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 but not so much in Munich, but in other parts of Germany. Um, and that's the difference. I mean, because Germany was a much more homogeneous society than it is today or than America is. That's right. And I think that one thing that your book does so beautifully is although the parallels are obviously uh, numerous, you do demonstrate, and unfortunately for the United States in 2022, that we're not quite in the situation that uh, Munich was in in 1920. I also want to mention that the book is beautifully written uh, 
And although it's exhaustively researched, um, it, is, uh, it is a pleasure to read despite its, its often difficult subject matter. So thank you, Michael, for the book. And thank you for having it translated from, from German. And, thank you. Uh, and, and I just want to thank also my wonderful translator, Jeremiah Rima. I don't know if he's on. And, um, and, and yes, you're right. We're not there yet, but we have to be very careful and, and really look out. All right. Thank, thank you very much. I will turn it over to Julia. Thank you both so much. Um, I would like to second that it's a beautifully written book. It's also got a beautiful cover. Um, we have some signed copies from the author. So if you, yes, there it is. It's, it's quite gorgeous, even given the subject matter. Um, there is beauty and meaning and lessons in dark things and all of this history. We really hope that you will follow the link in the chat column to get your copy from us at Politics and Prose. Um, find it there or visit us at politics-prose.com. Our thanks again to author Michael Brenner and Derek Penzlar this evening. Thank you both so much for being with us. And to everyone out there at home, we hope you are continuing to stay safe, stay strong, and of course, stay well read. And we will see you next time. Goodbye.